Welcome. My name is Torbjörn Nordling and I'm an assistant professor in automatic control at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the National Shengong University and the general chair of this workshop. Behind me I have the army barracks of the Japanese Army's Taiwanese Infantry 2nd Platoon built in 1911 and nowadays NCKU's Department of Industrial Design is housed in this building. It's my pleasure to introduce our Honorary Chair, Executive Vice President, Chair Professor Wu, that will welcome us all. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the National Chengkang University in Taiwan. I am proud that our team, the NCKU, Parkinson's disease quantifiers are one of the finalists in the OpenCV AI competition. They are also arranging this workshop. Now let us all learn computer vision and AI using the OD camera together. Hello and welcome. I am Akram Ashiani, postdoc researcher at the Department of Mechanical Engineering of National Chen Kong University and assisting chair of this workshop. It is my honor to introduce Mr. Niall O'Mahony, who is working on his PhD on the development of computer vision and artificial intelligence in the field of agri-tech. He has worked within IMA Research Center at Monster Technological University since 2015 and within Lear Research Center since 2017. His research experience includes sensor systems, embedded systems, robotics, and artificial intelligence. He will present types of machine learning algorithms in order to overview the different types of algorithms from the elementary machine learning for solving simple problems through to more advanced deep learning algorithms. And today we'll be covering types of machine learning algorithms. So here are the different uh, algorithms that we'll be looking over today. Uh, as you can see, there's quite a lot, but the whole aim is, uh, is not to go into the, into the fine detail of each one, but to give you a general idea of what each algorithm does, the pros and cons, and what, what they're good for. So um, the, you have, um, in machine learning, you have supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Uh, with supervised learning is um, where you're given a set of data that you have that you that you can use to learn from. So you know your your inputs and your desired outputs, and you can use that to do classification, basically learn which class the data belongs to, or re regression, which is. Um, to basically regress uh, a, a best fit curve to the data and use that to predict um, future data uh, based on, on, uh, on future inputs. And with unsupervised learning, it's basically learning from the nature or the shape of, that, of the data itself, basically um, uh, defining uh, uh, characteristic uh, clusters that the data forms, and uh, you, you have other things like uh, dimensionality reduction, reducing the data down to a, a number of, of dimensions that you can view on a graph or something like that. So with supervised learning, it's the most common approach. Uh, most common form of machine learning. They're given a set of data points, often labeled as with X, and associated set of outcomes, often labeled with Y. And we want to build a classifier to learn how to predict Y from X. Now, we have different types of prediction. You have regression and classification. Regression is uh, where you predict a continuous a line or plane um, or hyperplane that uh, you, you can use to predict uh, y from a, a given value x on the x-axis. 
example, linear regression. And with classification, uh, we basically want to tell does it, does it belong to a, uh, a class or not with binary classification, or does it, does which class from a set of classes does it belong to? And the, um, the, the classification problems in particular can be split into a number of different types of models, uh, either discriminative or gen generative. Uh, with discriminative, discriminative, you d define decision boundaries, and uh, you basically use those boundaries to tell um, which class the, the objects belong to. And with generatives, generatives, you basically generate characteristics of the classes, or for example, probability distributions um, of each class. So, for example, the blue uh, class has this sort of probability distribution. So, if it lies somewhere around here, it has a very low or chance of of belonging to the blue class, but it's still not within the red class. So, we say it belongs to the blue. And examples of that are um, Gaussian discriminative analysis and naive Bayes. So a common term that's often used um, in uh, machine learning is the loss function. Uh, so you can read that for yourself, but it's uh, we won't get too involved with the mathematics in, in this lecture. But it's basically just a function of to tell uh, how different your your predicted value, often labeled as z or um, y hat in some places, uh, relates uh, corresponds to your real data value y. Uh, and it's basically a measure of how good you're doing uh, with your algorithm. So um, you uh, we've mentioned already the mean least squared error so it's basically the square of the error of your um, for example in linear regression your fitted line to the actual uh, for, to each point the sum of the squares in, in linear regression and um, it forms this kind of curve and from that we can actually perform gradient descent uh, so it's basically like an algorithm that tells you when you're when you're at the bottom of this curve or the bottom of the, of the valley, um, and it uses der derivatives and and uh, and maths like that. Um, another type of loss function is the logistic loss. It's also related to cross entropy. So the only difference between do these two is that this one can be used for uh, multiple classes. And this is often used for when, uh, binary classes. Um, so it's basically, it, it, it plots a probability distribution of whether it belongs to a class or not. So for example, in this problem, um, um, it's for whether uh, y is equal to minus one. So you have a low probability distribution that y is equal to minus one or um, uh, whether yeah, whether uh, you have a lower probability distribution that it belongs to this, this class uh, when you're down here, and uh, a high pro high probability down here. So in in a binary problem, these two are always inverted. Uh, so a low a low probability for this class is going to mean a high probability for this class. Another uh, kind of loss uh, function is the hinge loss. It's often used in things like support vector machines where it's the whole idea of, of separating uh, objects in a, in a, in a space. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it's just a general kind of a loss function where it maximizes the, the loss uh, if it's in a certain uh, direction whether it's positive or negative, and uh, if it's not, it's zero. And we'll discuss this in a little bit more 
uh, when we get to SVMs. And we, we already mentioned the, the cross entropy um, in relation to, to uh, classification problems. Um, and basically you can see here that it's, it's, it's much more um, pronounced or exaggerated when it gets closer to one. And that's kind of important um, when it comes to neural networks and activation functions. But that's just an aside for now um, if you if you get, get into further detail on those type of, of networks. So we'll start going through them, the, the different type of algorithms. So linear regression is the most basic, the most common um, for regression tasks. Yeah, it's a simple, simple algorithm. If it's a straight line, um, or high plane if you have more than two variables, uh, using least squares, least squares um, minimization. So in other words, it, it minimizes the sum of the least, um, of the squared error of these res uh, residuals to the line. <clears throat> And what you get is this, um, the, this, all the errors will, will be fitted to this curve because this, this, this is the, poly, the, the quadratic curve because it's the squared error. And uh, what happens is that, is that gradient descent is used to minimize um, the, 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 the errors and, and thus fit a better line. So uh, the pros, it's a simple method. It's a, um, easy to in, in, uh, interpret element. Uh, but the cons is that it assumes that uh, there's a linear relationship, relationship between the dependent and independent variables, um, which is often an incorrect, incorrect uh, assumption. Uh, and when there's a uh, uh, few observations, um, it, it can lead to overfitting, uh, as we show here. For example, you might have had a, a nice straight line here before, but with these outliers, the line is skewed to try and include these outliers. Uh, so, so uh, it, it's it's sensitive to noise. And here on the in the right hand corner, you'll have to note, notice of these slides, if you're looking at these algorithms later for your portfolio or your practicals, or just for your own interest, I've included some links to to, um, to implement implementation of these algorithms in code in, in Python or R, and later we'll see some other types of tools. And we'll get into these types of tools later, but um, in, 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 a, in a later lecture, but these are, are just for yourself um, later in the course that, that you might, might be able to go back to. So logistic regression is the, the counterpart uh, to linear regression uh, in, but instead in classification. So instead of the mean squared error, we use the, a cost function called the cost entropy or the log the log uh, loss. So instead of fitting a line to data, still it's, it instead fits uh, this sort of S shaped function, which is kind of a combination of the two functions um, we showed earlier, where um, one, one was trending this way, and the other was trending this way. And basically, uh, we, we can tell from uh, this function, say, for example, if we have, if we have uh, an input where the weight is high uh, in this section of the graph, sorry, uh, we, we, can, we know from, from, the, from this uh, logistic function that the probability of, of 
uh, it belonging to this class, say that we classify it as, as obese, is, is fairly high. But if we get a weight that's somewhere in the middle, we have probability around 50% between being obese and not obese. So you get this uh, sort of nice probabilistic interpretation of your problem. And what it does is at the, at the core of it, it tries out different values for intercepts and coefficients of your of your uh, linear uh, equation of the line. And um, uh, it, it, it keeps on trying different values until um, it finds values that results in probabilities or likelihoods that are closest to the actual observed probabilities. If the models themselves are still linear, so the only so it only works well with classes that are linear, linearly separate, separable, i.e., that they can be separated by a single decision surface or line, uh, as as in as in here. Um, so I mentioned the pros that has a nice probabilistic. Uh, Inter interpretation for classification problems. It's easy to update the model to take in new data. So in comparison to um, to more accurate approaches, uh, where you can get very, very accurate results with neural networks and things like that, the advantage of this type of approach is you don't need to train it on a whole bunch of data to, 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 do, to, do in, uh, to classify a new class. Uh, it's it's easy to update in that way. Uh, the cons it requires more data, a lot of data to achieve stability. It tends to underperform uh, uh, when there when there are multiple or non-linear decision boundaries, as we have. It needs to be um, the model themselves are linear, and they're not flexible enough to to ca to capture more complex relationships. So the next type of algorithm we'll look at is the sport vector machine. So the goal of the sport vector machine is to find the line that maximizes the minimum distance to the line. Um, so for example here, we find the line here. Uh, here, between these two points are the closest points uh, um, or, or, or observations um, that, that are similar to each other. And what we want to do here is we want to maximize the distance, the minimum distance, or um, we want to get the maximum margin uh, for this line. The margin is shown here with the dotted lines. <clears throat> and the hinge loss is used for, that, for this. So if you're, if you're considering um, uh, uh, the red class here. So, uh, the, depending on the class, the distance WT here is the signed distance uh, uh, for x in relation to x, uh, your your input uh, to to the line. So, depending on whether the, uh, this this you don't have to worry about the equations, but this hinge loss uh, basically hinges on whether it's positive or negative, and it can be used in either direction in this way to, to maximize the, 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 uh, the margin of the line to, to each class. And the main advantage of support vector machines is that you can use a mechanism called kernels. kernels. Which essentially calculate um, the distance between the two observations. Uh, it basically allows it to be used in nonlinear problems. Um, it's it's sort of a transformation, so it transforms the original data space into a space where the where where the um, 
uh, the, where the the the, book, the decision boundary um, where where this, where the where they can be linear linearly separable, and then it it applies then it maximizes the distance of the closest members of the separate classes, and then after that it it, it transforms it back into the original space and allows you to, to um, basically um, draw or define these um, non nonlinear lines. Uh, in that space. So the, the pros of SVMs is that it's very accurate and fairly robust to overfitting. Uh, it's good in high, dim high dimensional spaces. Um, SVMs were all the rage when I started my own um, masters in, in machine learning. Uh, in 2015, um, but then deep learning came about, and th these were kind of left left in their in, a, in their dust. So they're, they're kind of used for smaller problems, and uh, compared to, to neural ne networks and deep learning, but they they have the same kind of um, cons as as these kind of approaches. They're they're hard to in interpret. It's so actually hard, like. To, to, to interpret what what's going um, how how it's uh, you you can uh, you can actually see the line so it's hard to interpret how, how it's making its its um, decisions on what which which class it belongs to it's memory intensive so it loses a lot of uh, memory to um, to to actually run it uh, it's trickier to tune uh, you need to Pick the right kind of kernel to, to transform the space uh, in such a way that that you can map different different types of problems, whether there's um, different relationships in, in between between the classes in your data set, and it doesn't scale well to, to large data sets, which which is a lot of the reason why it, um, it was superseded by uh, deep learning. So the next kind of algorithm uh, is decision trees. So we, we spoke about decision trees briefly in the last tutorial. Um, so it's, it been uses um, this whole uh, principle of, of representing a problem as a, as a, a binary search tree. Um, uh, and it uses uh, to its advantage the fact that um, the longest or the worst case runtime is 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 only going to be the longest um, uh, the longest path in the tree. So learns in a hierarchical fa fashion by repeatedly splitting your data set into separate branches that maximize the information gain of each split. And it, this, this uh, branching structure allows um, regression trees, it's called regression trees if it's used for regression problems, uh, to learn uh, naturally nonlinear non relationships. So all the previous approaches only learned linear relationships and use different kinds of tricks to get around that. But this, this one can learn non-linear relationships uh, more naturally. And here you see the, I just explained the whole notion of the tree, the nodes, what, what the nodes are, the edges are, and then the leaves are. Um, so here we show a kind of problem um, whether, um, for example, it, it's a good idea to play play a, a game of football on a, a, on a certain day. So whether it's uh, sunny, uh, but if it's very if it's very humid, it won't be very pleasant. So we say no. Um, but if it's sunny, cloudy, we can say yes, and so on. So. 
So the basic idea, the steps in the algorithm are to choose the best at attributes to split the remaining instances, to make up that attribute, to make that attribute a decision node. So here's our decision node here. And basically, you pick you pick it in such a way that best fits the remaining set of data. And you do this in an iterative process. So after that split, you define a split here. That, that splits the upper, the upper half of the of the of the space. And uh, you do this iteratively. And what you can get is you can you can you can um, isolate the different regions. And re regression problems. Uh, the, the only difference between decision problems and regression problems is that um, regression problems they just use a threshold whether the values uh, fall above or below a certain a certain certain threshold. And the basic structure of creating a decision tree is the same. There, there's a, a different range. Uh, there's a whole range of different types of algorithms. They have the same kind of structure. The only different lie, difference lies in how we select the the, at, the attributes, uh, which uh, define um, which are based select based on um, how well it splits the data. So the pros of the of decision trees are easy to implement. It requires less data pre preparation work. Missing values have no impact. So, for example, if, um, if with other methods, you need to have a, a, a predefined strategy when you when you have missing missing data, whether you whether you classify them as 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 being a, a null case or 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 different kind of strategies like that. But with this with this kind of approach, it's not a problem. Um, it uh, it does not. It also does not require standard, standardization of, or normalization. It's easy to interpret and explain. And explain is, explainability is, is a very big thing when you get in, um, into uh, neural networks and things like that. It's, it's, it's a lot better in a lot of uh, domains, um, so life or death situations, to have a model that's explainable. Um, Basically, you, you know, say, 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 for example, why did we make that decision? Well, we made that decision because it was humid and the weather sunny. Uh, it's good for a few category, category variables. Um, but the cons are that it doesn't work uh, for smooth boundaries, as we see a kind of partition into a grid. Uh, before uh, it do, and it doesn't work when the variables are uncorrelated. So if 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 they're very dispersed, it basically just overfits to the data. It takes a long time to train the model, but it, uh, it can become uh, complex. Um, and these things kind of just mentioned here are why. Um, when, the, when unconstrained individual trees are prone to, to overfitting, because they keep on changing until they, they basically isolate every every bit of data. Um, but ensembles, ensemble methods um, are used to overcome this, and they're actually quite popular. So random forests are probably the most popular, and the this uh, way of of um, it's, it's kind of like a supercharged decision tree. Um, so it uses a very high number of decision trees built out of randomly selected sets of features. Um, uh, so what you get is um, it, it's kind of trade off. You, you trade off um, interoperability to accuracy. So it's, it's um, with all this great number of decisions, uh, it's, it's, it's um, it's highly un uninterpretable, but you get uh, uh, good performance, which makes it a very popular algorithm. 
and a uh, different way of, of um, boosting decision trees is gradient boosted trees. So it builds one tree at a time and each, uh, each new tree corrects some errors made by the previous tree. Um, so it, it can be quite um, descript descriptive of, of the problem um, or expressive. Um, so, and we put in co bits, uh, code samples for each of those um, types. So another um, notable mention is k nearest neighbors. So often known as KNN is a non-parametric approach, and um, where the response of the data point is determined by the nature of its k neighbors from the training set. Uh, it can be used for both classification and regression. So it's, it's good for um, very, very large data sets where we have a lot of different classes. You only need to consider the, the, the classes in the neighborhood of, 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 of your query um, point. So uh, the, the nearest neighborhood algorithms are instance based, which means that and they save each training observation. And so they, they didn't make uh, predictions for new observations by searching the similar, um, similar as in close to each other in, in, in this uh, kind of a latent space uh, and pooling their values. Uh, so the dis disadvantage of, of KNNs is that they are memory intensive and they perform poorly, poorly in, for high dimensional data and require a meaningful distance function to calculate similar. So you need a way of separating the classes in this kind of a, of a, of a latent space. And the, the latent space can, cannot have too many dimensions. In practice, training uh, uh, regularized regression or tree ensembles are almost always better, um, but it, it can be useful in, in, certain, in certain scenarios. So the other type of models we looked at were models. And the, the classic example of this is naive Bayes. Uh, so you might remember we spoke about Bayesian optimization before. And B Bayes, when you ever mention Bayes, it's all about the, the conditional probability. So the probability that a uh, certain of the observation belongs to a class or not. And it's, it's essentially you basically um, uh, your model is a probability table that generates uh, the data for your training data. So basically each uh, line table for each class um, is, 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 has parameters based on the features of your data. And You basically look up the, the, the class probabilities in, in, in your probability tab table based on, 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 on the feature values of your input. It's called naive because it, its core uh, assumption is the conditional independence of, uh, of each point in the input data, i.e. that all input features are independent from, from, one, each, from, from one another. And uh, this is rarely true in the real, real world, but despite this, it, they perform surprisingly well, uh, despite the fact that they're so simple 
an easy to implement. And they can scale well with your data set. And uh, you can also incorporate prior knowledge. So with other types of approach, you, gen you generally initialize your um, your 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 um, you, you you can't say assume that you know that there's a fifty percent chance at the start um, if it's a heads or tails kind of problem or you you can you can basically initialize your your um, your your probability table with known um, prior beliefs about the problem you're you're trying to solve. The cons are that it's a uh, strong that, that strong and unrealistic feature independence of, uh, assumptions are there, and it fails at estimating rare occurrences, and it can have irrelevant um, features. So irrelevant features means that your model is bigger than it needs to be. So um, the next type of algorithm it's, uh, has become very popular in recent years um, is, is deep learning, or um, in its simplest form, artificial neural networks. And the whole um, print, uh, idea behind uh, deep learning was um, to model it after the, the, the human brain. It's basically a network of very simple computing nodes or neurons, um, as in the brain analogy, uh, connected by axions or, or uh, connected weights which are basically um, define how much influence each neuron has on the subsequent or connected neurons. So for each neuron uh, and its, uh, all its inputs are, 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 for each neuron, its inputs are multiplied by a set of, set of weights and you, add, you can add a bias term. And that's basically the, sim the, the simplicity of comp the, the computation that's done, that's done in the neuron. And after, uh, you also have an activation function. It's, it's sort of a function um, for, max, for kind of regularizing the, the data as you go through it, um, so that only uh, very active, um, very activated neurons uh, get, get through. So um, if, 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 if neurons uh, result in a value of pin zero, the value needs to be very, very close to one before it gets activated and gets through. That's the whole idea of this activation function. And that's then passed to, to a cost function. And we spoke about a cost function before. Um, it's basically an estimation of, of your error or how well you're doing. And you can use gradient descent to, f to minimize that error. And what networks use is a process called backpropagation. It's a, it's a process of how, of using this um, this gradient uh, relative to the weights of each stage or layer of the network, and propagating that back all the way through the network. In, in how many different hidden layers you, you can have. So they're, they're, um, they can learn extremely complex patterns, uh, extremely nonlinear um, relationships. So the hidden layers are so-called, they're sort of uh, intermediary representations at each stage of the network. If they form intermediary re representations. And there are several important mechanisms which we'll mention uh, in a little bit, such as convolutions, which, which are popular in uh, computer vision. 
uh, which is uh, computer um, science in relation to looking at images. Um, and I kind of threw you at you this in this slide, but the the strength of 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 uh, deep learning is that it um, forms well on image and audio and text data, where there's a lot of inputs. Say, for example, in in, in image, there's if you have a HD image, it could be um, a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels. So that many inputs in it to to your uh, to to uh, to consider, and um, so so it can actually perform well on 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 large amounts of data, and also very large data sets. And the whole reason neural networks are so popular now. Uh, they, were, they were actually the mathematics for it was um, was was there in the 1950s, but they only became popular in recent times uh, due to um, at the availability of data, um, amounts of images collected from the internet, and from the availability of parallel processors in uh, GPUs, uh, which are um, in, in gaming, using gaming um, uh, and uh, video cards. And the weaknesses of deep learning or the cons are, it's not suitable, it's not a general purpose algorithm. Um, it's, it's basically you train it to do a certain job. And if you need to do it in order, another job, you have to train it all over again. It's just good for that job. It's called narrow AI. Um, and it can be outperformed by three ensembles um, and classical uh, machine learning problems if if you if 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 you take it outside of the of the domain it was trained for. Uh, it's computationally intensive to train and require um, so it's it's not trivial to train a neural network. There's a lot of things that you that you have to watch out for. Uh, you can't you can't let it do it automatically to transfer from from one part problem to another. And we'll, we'll look at all these kind of terms later in the in the practicals uh, and how to train neural networks. Um, yeah, and we mentioned that uh, neural networks are very popular in computer vision, and it's because of this whole um, principle of convolution of applying your weights and biases over a, a, of a over a sliding window, a small portion of the image, and basically, as you as you slide down through each layer, the the, the feature space gets smaller and smaller, so you're sliding over a smaller and smaller grid, and you apply different thi uh, things like regularization and max pooling to pool the most activ activated areas, and uh, basically define a feature, a feature vector of that characterizes your your um, your e each of the features that are pre present in the image. And you basically perform um, your your binary classification, your logistic regression, your softmax softmax regression. At the final layer, basically decide on which class belongs to for a certain set of, of uh, features. Another type of approach is genetic algorithms. So um, genetic. Uh, is the so-called genetic algorithms because they're based on the principles of genetics and natural selection. Uh, so, so there's there's a lot of diff interesting um, um, different problems it's 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 been it's been used to solve, uh, which which are which are gen generally intractable, i.e., that it would take a, a lifetime to search. The, uh, to, to search the solution space to find the optimal solution. Um, 
for example, in um, more practical problems in the, the design uh, of um, a rendering of, of models of aircraft. And we see here that it's been used. Um, I can speed up this. It's it's been used in in here to find the to train um, uh, any any uh, basically with with each iteration uh, in this in this kind of type problem of training a car how to to navigate a track. They, they basically use natural selection. So with each race, the the, the top uh, leaders, the, the the first few that came first in the race, are selected to um, are to survive in in the nat kind in the natural selection analogy. And um, what they end up with is is cars that can actually at first they can't really navigate the course at all. See they're crashing everywhere. But then they eventually end up with cars that can navigate the course in the, in the shortest time. It's been used in other problems. For example, here, in, um, they, they use genetic algorithms to, to draw the Mona Lisa from triangles. And there's other interesting problems like that that genetic algorithms have been used for. And here are the steps of a genetic algorithm. So we have terms like the population, or uh, the kind of the set of solutions you're starting out with, and you evaluate, evaluate them with what's called a fitness function. So think of survival of the fitness, the, the fittest. And you have things like you, you cross over and you use crossover and mutation on the surviving um, uh, population that generate a new generation of uh, child um, uh, of of children that that then iterate onto the next population and so on and so on until you get the best solution and so you you can actually come with fast models that run quite fast and efficiently. Uh, it takes a long time to train, but the models themselves that are, that are produced are, 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 can be can be quite fast. Uh, it's easy to implement uh, once you have a, a good fitness function. A good another advantage is that you'll always get you always end up with a good solution once you wait long enough. Um, Cons are that it's, it's, it's random, so, like natural selection. It's not, um, it's not guaranteed to, to be the optimal, optimal solution. Uh, it's just kind of random mutation and crossover of different, of different, um, of different solutions. Uh, you can get stuck on, on local maxima, uh, but there's different types of ways to, to come around this, and it's, uh, it's an evolving field. Another type of, of, of machine learning algorithm, it's nearly a class of its own. Uh, uh, said it doesn't really fall into supervised learning, is um, reinforcement learning. So it's kind of related to, to, um, to what we were talking about with gen genetic algorithms, where it kind of comes up with its own solutions um, uh, to a problem. So it basically learns a policy of how, of, of how to act in a given environment. So it learns from experience. So here, the, the, this is just a, a, a kind of a, a video that was doing the rounds at one stage of a, an, an agent, a human agent, uh, well, with the, the anatomy of human, which was um, trained using reinforcement learning on how to walk. And they, they kind of came up with all sorts of crazy motions to keep balance. Um, so uh, the agent's ex action influences the state of the world, which determines its reward. 
And basically, um, the, the, the whole goal of it is to, is to optimize the total future discounted award, i.e. immediate reward can be worth more than future reward. And it's, also, it's, it's often trained in simulations. So there's this thing called the Open, open AI Gym. Uh, which which can say train different different agents in in simulations like that. And um, I think I think that's the we look at unsupervised learning. So the most common problem in unsupervised learning is clustering. Um, it's, so it's, it's this whole idea of finding natural groupings of observations or clusters based on the inherent structure uh, within your data set. Uh, examples include uh, customer segmentation, uh, grouping similar items in e-commerce or, um, or social network analysis. And um, because clustering is unsupervised, i.e. there's no right, dance, right answer, you can't really evaluate um, your accuracy or things like that um, based on your um, a known, a known uh, validation data set. Um, you often just visualize your results and to see how well um, the, the groupings are made. And another kind of uh, unsupervised um, machine learning approach is used for visualizations called dimensionality reduction. And uh, those include PCA, principal component analysis, and TSNE, um, stochastic nearest um, neighbors kind of approach. So, which PCA? PCA is the most common form of uh, dimensionality reduction. You basically take, uh, you kind of define uh, print, what they call principal components or principal dimensions um, along which the variance, variance of the input and output data is maximized. So, as you can see here, if they define two principal components or dimensions, um, uh, which can best separate the the different types of of, ob of object classes. Um, so they're, they're they're representing this um, three dimensional space as a two dimensional space. But it can go much be much more than that. Um, say it can it can it can, it can vi you can use it to visualize the. Uh, 128 dimension space onto two dimensions. Uh, uh, but the cons are that it implies strong linear assumptions and the points are a weighted summation of features. So you can get a loss of data or um, a data that you can't really see as a, a result of this. And the, the most one of the most common types of clustering approaches is k-means clustering. So it basically uh, finds similar clusters. So as you can hear, see here, it kind of keeps going until the, the clusters are fairly similar. So it, it, it stops when uh, it stops when they're all at the round the roundness in, in this in this example. It can detect. It can be used to detect outliers. Um, it suffers from multicollinearity. It's a, that's the term we'll look at in the next lecture. And it can only be used um, for clusters that are spherical. It can't detect any other shape. And it requires, it depends, um, the, the, its performance depends on how it's initialized. So, for example, you need to, to define uh, how many clusters are, are in the space, which it's not very easy if you don't know it beforehand. So, so we've looked over 
a good number of algorithms there. Um, but what are the, the key takeaways of of the diff or when you compare the different types? Um, so one of the 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 key trade-offs is interpretability versus accuracy. So so the more accurate, generally the more accurate um, a model gets, for example, with deep learning or random forests, you can't really tell what it's doing inside the box. Um, so in comparison to, say, linear regression, where you basically know that it's, 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 it's fitting a line to the data and it's basically using that equation of the line in your uh, at your uh, prediction stage um, to to predict to predict um, y based on x input into that qu into that equation, and also with dec decision trees, for example, they're also quite interpretable. Um, basically, you, you you can define you define a number of decisions based on your input data, and you can basically um, know. Um, how how you you basically have a, a a clear program of how those decisions are laid out, but with other methods they're they're more abstract in how they um it's not necessarily hidden on, on how they on how they work. It's just a lot of different weights and and weights and biases and different sort of transforms that are applied um, that don't necessarily make sense at the intermediary stages. But the, the kind of the the the, the agglomeration of, 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 of all those processes comes to a, a very accurate solution. And this is a nice um, chart on on uh, to use, um, for example, in your own portfolio or or project that that you're doing on what algorithms might be suitable for the problem. You, you want to look at. So if you if you want to try dimension reduction, you you branch off into this uh, corner. So if you if you have different topics, you can use PC principal component analysis analysis. Or if you um, or sorry, if you don't have different if you if you if you want to do topic modeling, um, and whether you want to, to represent it as probabilistic, probabilistic or not, you can use these kind of algorithms. Uh, if you have responses, i.e. if you have training data, you can um, you can go down into this branch and you can do uh, based on whether you want to do classification regression and based on accuracy and explainability and the number of the, the the how much data you have, uh, you can you, be, you can basically make decisions on on what each algorithm is good in each case. 